everyone, uh, welcome and uh, thank you so much for joining us here for our event with Laura Bazelon and the launch of her uh, just out debut uh, novel, A Good Mother. Uh, here to discuss the book with Laura is Sarah Marshall. My name is Evan Karp, I'm the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore in mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. Uh, Sarah Marshall is a writer, podcaster and media critic focused on setting straight our collective memory or at least getting to the bottom of why we believe uh, and in turn define ourselves by popular narrative and myth. Uh, why is the maligned woman a staple of our news media? Why do we believe that serial killers are brilliant? How do we keep stumbling into all these moral panics? These are some of the questions that propel Sarah forward. Uh, she's the co-host of the popular modern history podcast, You're Wrong About, which has been highlighted in The New Yorker, The Guardian, and Time Magazine. Her writing has appeared in The Believer, BuzzFeed, and the true crime collection, Unspeakable Acts. She loves Portland, Oregon, Philly, and Las Vegas in that order, and it has been rumored that she is writing a book about the satanic panic. Laura Bazelon is an attorney, journalist, McDowell Fellow, former public defender, and professor at the University of San Francisco's School of Law, where she holds the Philip and Muriel C. Barnett Chair in Trial Advocacy. She's also the author of Rectify, The Power of Restorative Justice After Wrongful Conviction, which we had the, the pleasure of, of launching, uh, as well as the upcoming nonfiction book, Ambitious Like a Mother, Women, Ambition, and Motherhood. And her writing has been published widely in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, The Washington Post, and many others. Um, uh, thank you all so much for joining us, being here. Laura, congratulations on the book. Uh, very, very delighted to have you back with us. Um, and uh, congratulations on the launch. Sarah, thank you so much uh, for being here and for leading the conversation. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to stop talking and turn it over to you too. Uh, congratulations, Laura. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evan. I am so incredibly appreciative of you and that beautiful introduction and Booksmith. And I'm incredibly honored to be with you, Sarah. And just knowing that there's friends and family watching, even though I can't see you, I know you're there and it's making me very happy. It's so great to be here. And Laura, I'm so happy to be talking with you or to have my disembodied voice here talking with you today through the limitations of my internet. Um, I promise my face is completely normal and human and I haven't gotten bitten by any cryptids lately. Um, but yeah, this is, this is to me such an, ex okay, I thought that I was really smart because I realized the other day, I was like, oh, it's coming out the Tuesday after Mother's Day. It's like symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is wonderful. <laughs> But so I feel like, you know, whenever a book enters the world, it's always a blessing. But that, like, this was a book that in my kind of pandemic brain, which has a harder time reading um, than ever before, like, this was something that just pulled me in and kept me moving through it in a way that I am really. I'm really excited for people to encounter. And one of the first things I noticed about it was that this is a book that like very elegantly like shows you what it is like to be a public defender in a way that I really haven't encountered in other fiction. Um, and I guess I would love to hear about like, I guess my, my first question is, it feels like anytime you try and write a book, you know, you one of the questions is like, what am I not seeing out there that I want to be available to other people? And I'm curious about what holes you identified in the world. So before I answer that question, which I'm excited to answer, I wanna say that you have an absolutely beautiful face and I'm sorry that people are not seeing it. And yet I also think that it's somehow appropriate that it's just your disembodied voice <laughs> because <laughs> two million people a month listen to your podcast. And so I think for them, they very much are comfortable with the way that they are interfacing, interacting with you. Um, in terms of what I was trying to do with this book, and thank you for saying that it, it, it talks about public defenders in a way that books normally don't. I feel that way too. And I have always been looking for a public defender protagonist that really grabbed me and who I felt like I could relate to. And I 
felt that, especially in shows, you and I have talked about Law and Order in particular, but other shows, they're always kind of bumbling and overwhelmed and dumb and doing a terrible job. And actually, public defenders are, I think, the most creative, gutsy, ambitious, fierce advocates out there. They're some of the best lawyers I've ever seen. And that doesn't get showcased. And I felt like it was important to do that and really explain why they're so cool. And it just so happens, I think, in our culture that a bit they're having a moment because finally mm -hmm. we're having this racial reckoning and this understanding of what's wrong with the system. And they're the people who I think in some ways are our best positioned to fix it. And so that was really important to me. And also it was important to me to have it be, have one of the public defenders be a woman because I think even now when public defenders are starting to get more acclaim, it's generally at least public facing the men who are getting that acclaim. And I think so often these women advocates are the unsung heroes of the system. And so I felt like I wanted to kind of shine a light on, on them. And this is, I'm sure I've read statistics to this effect, but in my, but also in my, my anecdotal experience, like what I guess I would broadly call indigent, indigent defense is like remarkably female skewed in terms of the people who work in it compared to other areas of law. Like, is that true? I think to some degree that is true. I feel like my office, <laughs> I still call it my office, even though I have not worked there since 2008, but it was probably roughly 50-50. And I think in some of the indigent defense slash social worker type jobs, people always talk about how there's a social work piece of being a public defender or being an indigent defense lawyer or being an advocate for kids, that that kind of naturally associates sometimes with what are seen as women's strengths. And so it may draw a disproportionate number of women. And then I also think that sometimes jobs that are government jobs are easier for women to maintain in part because they're more flexible once women decide to have families. Although that's, in, you know, they're not going to expect you to bill like a thousand hours and there's parts of the office, different jobs you can shift into maybe a collaborative court where you're not in trial all the time. And so it's survivable in a way that probably a high paced law firm job would be less. But I also think that it's true that these jobs are just incredibly hard and grinding. And that's something that maybe women are best positioned to endure because women endure. Hmm. Yeah, and I and this is and we should have you jump in and read a little excerpt at whatever time you want to, and maybe this is it. But I also feel as if, you know, the the <laughs> Just the emotional toll of the work is to me such a present part of this book. And it, I feel like that we, we don't really see that as much either. Like I think we were really accustomed in pop culture to seeing what I guess I would call, although I don't think that the genre would call it the emotional labor of the detective. Um, where it's like, you know, just all these, all these women I love keep getting murdered, basically, which is, I think, in a way, an easier thing to depict than just, you know, a role where like, essentially having the truth on your side is like, it's nice, but it's not really a guarantee of anything particularly. And, and I think what I also, what I find, um, one of the things I find so compelling about just how much strength, I guess what to me shows how much strength that role requires is, you know, what your, what I would call your heroine in this book. I think people might say she has some anti-heroics. I disagree. Um, but she, like, she's it. Like, she understands that, like, she has taken on, if she's not, like, in a mother role to her client, like, she is the only one who has the who is appointed by society to protect her when no one else will essentially, or that that is what her office is being charged to do. And that frankly sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> that, it's, that is so interesting that you put it that way because I feel like we're in a mind meld in that it actually does segue <laughs> into what I was thinking about reading. So I can read it and then maybe, okay. So this is a short, this is just a short Perfect. part of the book and it's in the beginning, so no spoilers here. Just to set the scene, the protagonist that um, Sarah was talking about is a public defender. Her name is 
Abby and she's in a relationship with her partner. His name is Nick and they've just had a baby and she's supposed to be taking maternity leave. And then this murder case comes along and it's this 19 year old who has a baby almost the same age as, as Abby and Nick's baby, whose name is Cal. And Abby wants to go back early from her maternity leave to try the case. So this is part of the scene where they're discussing it over Chinese food. <clears throat> they sit in silence for a moment. Abby says, this is how you show me you love me. I don't want a diamond ring or a white dress. I don't want happily ever after. I want to try this case. I want you to make this possible for me. Don't do this, Abby. There are half a dozen people in your office who could do a great job, including no doubt this guy they just hired from JAG. It doesn't have to be you. She shakes her head. I've tried to tell myself that too, but I actually think the opposite. I think I can try this case in a way that no one else can. Why? Nick's voice is cold. Abby looks down at Cal and passes her fingers lightly over his soft downy head. I love you, darling boy. She wonders if he can hear the unspoken thought, if he knows that the love she feels is deep and desperate and yet driving her away. Because I'm a brand new mother too, the way Luz was those few times that I met her, I feel that now. She killed her husband in this horrible, violent way, but she did it to save her baby. Nick shakes his head. You have no idea why she killed her husband. I know that that's the story that the jury needs to believe. Before I had Cal, I understood that story as a legal theory. Now I understand it in my bones. I love that part and there's so much happening there but I feel as if something something that's also present in this book that I feel is so underrepresented just in American culture is this idea of like because you love your baby you recognize that like you need to be doing other things like not just being you know and this idea that um you can still have a sense of purpose that forces you to go into a world that by its own design, you can't take your baby into, into with you. And um, I don't know, I, I love that this book is called A Good Mother. I feel like that's a phrase that does a lot of work throughout and everyone is kind of coming at it with their own baggage. And um, yeah, I, well, and one of the questions that I have is, you know, a novel is such a process. I was actually just reading Stephen King's on writing yesterday and he says that writing I think he says writing a novel is like crossing the Atlantic in a bathtub <laughs> basically so like what was it about this bathtub that like you know you were like I assume that like me if you have one project that works you you have 50 that you know just the corpses of which are scattered around um yeah so so why this one why why is this the book that that we have in our hands now today well, I mean, as for Stephen King's analogy, I wonder if Stephen King maybe has a motorboat instead of a rowboat because he's definitely powered his way back <laughs> and forth across the he Atlantic. He's like whittled a bathtub into like a, it's like a lightweight fiberglass, like kayak. It's a kayak shaped tub and he has an oar. Yeah. <laughs> if whatever his bathtub is, I would like his bathtub. Um, but to answer your question, this is a labor of love for me. And actually, it's funny. I was emailing with my with my lovely agent, Emma, this morning. And I was saying that from the beginning of our relationship to, that, to this point, it's been more than seven years. And that's because there was another iteration of this book that had the same protagonist that we she could not sell. And it was just, I can't even, I don't have the words for how disappointing that was. And I guess it's sort of like, well, at that point, why would you not just stop because it's so painful to labor at something and have so much invested and then feel like it was never able to be brought to life and maybe you should just turn around and do something that that has a better chance of success and all I can say about that is I've just really felt compelled to write I just always have and especially with these characters and I just I gave them different things to do when I gave them a different plot, but they were real people. They talk to me when I'm standing in line at Trader Joe's, when I'm sitting in traffic waiting to get my kids. I just feel like they're real to me. And so 
I just, I guess maybe they were in the bathtub too. And so I was just trying to get across the Atlantic, but you're right, Sarah. I mean, and actually I feel better hearing you say that because I just assume that everything you do <laughs> turns into like this amazing thing. But yeah, it's that's not how it works. It's not how it works. There's so much rejection and cul-de-sacs and feeling really crappy about yourself and like it's never going to work out. And I guess I just felt like if I tried hard enough, <laughs> my dad gave me this advice once. He was like, you know, if he, he said this about us, like meaning my dad and me, he's like, people like you and me, we just have to work harder to get what we want. But if we work hard enough, eventually we're going to get it. And I've just always believed that. And I don't know, in this case, it, it worked out. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, I just was asked to write a short piece about Saw and why I like Saw, because there's a new Saw movie coming out. And I ended up in this swamp of like, well, to understand Saw, we must understand the slasher movie. And to understand the slasher movie, we must understand the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And then I was like, wait, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, so I think it, the process of writing for me so much is about figuring out, like figuring out what I think and also figuring out where I am emotionally and what's inside me. And I mean, to that end, I would also love to talk about more of your characters because you have told me that people, I would call Will your deuteragonist um, and he's certainly a POV character throughout. And I've heard that you've said that people don't always respond positively to him. And I, I feel like Will is like, again, without getting into spoilers, to me, he's like such a sympathetic portrayal of someone who makes very questionable decisions for reasons that make total sense to me based on just who he is and, and yeah, and just his willness. And so, yeah, I would love to know, like, you know, you have, you have this big cast that is very, that is just constantly in conflict with each other, which means there's always kind of something to enjoy in terms of the way that we can watch them kind of sparking with each other a lot of the time and then a, and some pretty perilous stakes as well because of that but I I feel I never feel as if any of these characters are like two-dimensional or that you feel just sort of that they're not important to you like they all feel they all feel like they matter to you I mean is that an accurate read? That is an accurate read and I appreciate, I appreciate especially you saying that, Sarah. And I, I just, I will say, I mean, your podcast, You're Wrong About, has been a mainstay of my life for a long time, but has especially been a mainstay of my life during the pandemic where I've been utterly addicted to it. And part of that is because you and Michael are so good at taking people who history has seen as extremely unsympathetic or have done things that are very difficult to understand and, and thus make them on the surface seem unrelatable and explain why there are things worth knowing and saving and loving about them. And I think you two do that in a way that is utterly remarkable across just an enormous span of people in, in modern US history. And you're right. like some of the early readers of this book and early reviewers of this book have disliked both Abby, the protagonist, and Will, her partner, her trial partner. They're both public defenders. And people have said, you know, they don't have any ethics and there's no one to like in this book. And, and about Will, they've been especially harsh because he does do a series of things that, that I think politely can be called questionable. But to me, they are sympathetic. And him, especially because, well, first of all, I just was so, it was so fun for me to, to write from the perspective of a man. I'd never done that. And that was the most fun that I had was being him. But he's not a bad person. He's just sort of caught up in emotions that are really beyond his control. And he has this obsession with this writer, John Fowles, who I similarly have an obsession with and who is this writer of, of British fiction, mostly in, in the late, 20th century, but it's become less known over time. I don't know why, because I think he's completely amazing. And, and Will kind of sees himself in the model of these British gallant protagonists and this kind of romantic idea of, of, of chivalry and gallantry. And he has this kind of naive view of things and the way he's supposed to be in the world and his relationship to other people in particular, 
women. And so I really wanted to, to play around with that and, and, and bring out the fact that yes, like it, he does do some things that are pretty awful, but at the same time, he's not a bad person. And actually he's a really good lawyer. And so I feel like in spite of everything, or maybe because of it, there's a lot to appreciate about him and feel sympathetic. I love, so I've never read um, The French Lieutenant's Woman, but I love The Collector. Um, yes. Which to me, yeah, and which which was influential to The Silence of the Lambs, I know, and was yes. really also kind of a forgotten classic, and it was a really amazing movie with Terrence Stamp. But I mean, that's a piece of literature that is about someone who very methodically kidnaps a woman and keeps her in a dungeon. It's like, it's yes. a nice dungeon, but it's a dungeon. And, you know, without, and, and I know that it was written, you know, not sympathetically to, uh, to the kidnapper character, but at the same time, like it is, it is impossible to spend that much time, I think, in someone's head or in proximity to these characters without having a deeper degree of understanding of them, like if they're coherently drawn which I think there are in this case. And that there's something, I know that it's kind of a cliche to say like, we must read fiction because it makes us more empathetic, but I really think it does. And I think there's something interesting to me also about how in kind of legal, like courtroom stories, legal fiction, legal pop culture, um, the focus is almost always on separating the innocent from the guilty and convicting the guilty basically. And like, that's what every episode of Law and Order is about. And God knows I've watched all of them several times. Um, Me too. And, yeah, right. And I think just like acknowledging it, like saying that you don't like, like some people don't like Law and Order, but for me to say I don't like Law and Order would be to say I don't like potato chips. It would be the biggest lie and like denial of my humanity. And like, I love it when you're watching Unsolved Mysteries and Robert Stack is like, perhaps you could solve a mystery and you're like maybe I could you know so like <laughs> there's something to me that still that feels <laughs> totally. very new about creating fiction that's like that's that's not that has a different set of questions I guess basically and I think that loops into like I'm actually gonna two for what I'm gonna do a two for one question which is like okay. how can you defend guilty people and which I'm sure is like you've answered one to two thousand times so you're all ready and be like why write about guilty people so not yes, that that's I, necessarily happening here but why would one do that right no it's it's great it's a great question and i think i yes you're absolutely right i got asked that all the time and actually maybe 10 years ago a professor invited me to speak in front of their criminal procedure class their 1l class that had like 100 people in it and the question that started off the conversation was the professor asking me, how do you sit next to that scumbag? That was the question. And I think when you get that question at cocktail parties, perhaps it's more poli politely worded, but that's what people wanna know. And so there's a different, there's different ways to answer that question. There's the constitutional answer, which is if you didn't have me, the system would be broken. You need someone holding up the other end of the constitution and enforcing the sixth amendment and making sure that the right to counsel actually has meaning and the prosecution doesn't just get to railroad people. And so that's that's one answer. And I think that's a valid answer. And, and I appreciate that answer. But to me, it's it's far, far beyond that. It's about the fact that our entire criminal justice system, to me anyway, is utterly shaped by 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 slavery, by institutional racism, by hatred of the other, by hatred of, of women. And it's really a system that's designed to punish and over incarcerate in a way that is just absolutely shocking, both in terms of how excessive and crazy the penalties are, but also who they get imposed on. And it just was so obvious to me early on that the deck was completely stacked and that to be a prosecutor, basically, especially a federal one, meant that the FBI lined up all your ducks and you went in and said, what happened next? What happened next? What happened next to about five witnesses? talked about how guilty the person was and sat down. It's much, much harder when you're up against the weight of that evidence to sort of explain why maybe they haven't met their burden. Maybe there's a defense here that you didn't think about that they didn't even contemplate. And then 
beyond that, what does it really mean to convict someone? And, you know, when our clients took a walk, that's what we called it, taking a walk, when our clients got acquitted, it wasn't necessarily, oh, thank God, this wrongfully accused person was spared, because that wasn't necessarily the case. It was more just, okay, the government didn't just get one more person. And to me, that was a very, very important service. And it's just so easy to look at people who are accused of crimes or actually not look at them at all, just look away from them, but think about them as, um, as disposable. And I was thinking about this the other day because this past semester, my law students and I in the racial, racial justice clinic took this case, this total Hail Mary long shot case in Louisiana where I do not even have a bar card. And our client had been convicted at the age of 19 of an armed robbery that took, I think, 120 seconds and netted about $102. And for that crime where nobody was injured and a white man was robbed and a black teenager was convicted, he got 60 years with no possibility of parole. <clears throat> and his only other conviction was for selling drugs. And when I would tell people about his sentence in California, which is still draconian, they would gasp. But when I told people in Louisiana, they would just shrug because that's what everybody gets. And they just handed them out like candy. And my client actually didn't do it. He was eight miles away. And so he was innocent. But I would have taken it if he was guilty because it's just outrageous to me, outrageous to me that let's just say he did it. He robbed somebody of $102 for two minutes at, at 19 and he's going to die in there. Like he's going to be in there till he's 79. It just was not fathomable. And I felt like if there aren't people who find that not just outrageous, but are willing to go to the mat and basically pour the next two years of their life into trying to fix that, or better yet, do a good job in the first place so they don't get convicted, that is maybe the most important thing that, that you can do. And I don't, I don't know. I've represented people who are guilty. I've represented people who are innocent. I don't love the guilty people any less. Um, because it's just about a much bigger existential question, which is like, who are we trapping up in this system? What have they actually done? And, and what should we be doing to them before and after? Yeah, and I think there's something about writing about motherhood and incarceration that makes some of those issues maybe feel more clear cut than they were than they would otherwise, or I would hope that they do, because to me, the sort of the spec, like the stakes in this book are that Abby's client is going to potentially go to prison um, and not be able to, and lose her baby who's like, who's a newborn practically. She's, a, she's an infant more accurately. Um, and yeah, there's just, I, I feel like maybe the, the numbness <laughs> That, that we are able to have around incredibly long sentences because as news consumers, we just hear about them so much, like maybe that's able to become rote, applying it to the mother who is allegedly the person who America is all for and about and the, and the person who these laws are supposed to be taken care of. Like, I feel as if, you know, if, if you ask people like, why do we lock up people for so long? Why do we have such harsh punishments? Why are we, you know, truly more afraid of, of uh, letting a guilty person walk free than accidentally convicting an innocent one. I feel like the answer is like, well, we want a safe world for our children. And it's like, okay, but like, how does, how does mothers in prison or mothers in jail or mothers giving birth in shackles uh, contribute to that? And I, I feel as if there's, you know, the, this book is so concerned with sort of like, <laughs> the place where the carceral and the maternal intersects. And I feel like that's, that seems like something that a lot of people aren't necessarily made to think of that much. So I think it's really exciting that it's in this. I think that's a good point about mothers. Everybody loves a mother until she speaks or steps outside of her house or does anything remotely controversial because as soon as that happens, basically as soon as she speaks or acts, we're all too ready to pass judgment and mothers in the criminal justice system tend to fare very, very poorly in part because the thinking is, how could you have possibly done this? You're a mother. And then the response to that is to separate them, to separate them from their children. And 
this particular person, she's she's 19. She's accused of a really terrible crime, whether she did it or not. I mean, you have to read to the end. And even then, I feel like it's somewhat, you know, it's kind of up to you as the reader what you decide. But part of what's what's driving her and the lawyer who's helping behind the scenes, her lawyer from when she was a kid, is this terror that she'll be separated from her child and she won't be able to to mother her and she won't be able to raise her child the way that she wants to. And I think the lawyer who who represented her in the past, who who comes back and plays kind of a crucial role throughout, really understands that dilemma, that fear, and also that people in her community are just getting thrown away. And that when he is thinking about the stakes for her, he's also understanding that from her perspective, motherhood is so important to her that she's willing to really to risk everything and that she doesn't really, I think, want to be alive unless she is able to be a parent. And that's a pretty amazing kind of mom, I think. Yeah, and it occurs to me, we, you said something a little earlier about, you know, needing to pour, needing people needing to pour two years of their life into a case to get someone, you know, innocent freed of a, you know, 60 years in prison. And it occurs to me that like, that's, that to me feels like a parallel between motherhood itself, where it's like, what is like motherhood is a lot of things, but one of them is time. And one of them is time that you are dedicating to doing something that means you can't do other stuff. Um, and, and like, just making this major time commitment that you can't unmake, which is one of the, um, one of the things that gets some moms in trouble down the line. But, you know, just the, the fact of just the kind of expenditure of care and passion that goes into just, you know, a sanction. And also, I mean, I think another a choice in this book that I really appreciate is that we have a client who is just hard to get a read on and who kind of changes the relationship is changing throughout. There's like, we're, we don't start the story in a place where she's being, um, you know, feels able to trust either of her lawyers. And there's, I, I warned you that I was going to bring up Primal Fear, which is my favorite 90s yes. thriller, because Me I too. think it's like, I'm going to spoil Primal Fear, so sorry. But um, <laughs> the, the reveal movie. of Primal Fear is that Richard Gere is a defense lawyer, and he has a client who seems very sympathetic and is accused of committing this murder, and is saying that his, like, his alter ego did it. He has multiple personality disorder and this other side of his personality committed the murder and he compartmentalized his abuse that way. And then it turns out at the end that he's actually like a full-time violent jerk and he's just not nice. And the like sort of sweet stammering kind of persona he was presenting, like that's the lie. And the murderer is the real persona. And Richard Gere ends the movie being like, why do I even do this job basically and I remember watching it and I was like well okay but like all the mitigation is the same that tape <laughs> that you entered into evidence is the same like the abuse is still there the the comprehension of why he would commit the murder is still there so is it is the only difference that like the fear this person has is that their client is going to be like I schooled you I tricked you I'm not lovable I'm not cute <laughs> like I'm technically innocent, but I'm not adorable. <laughs> oh my God, Sarah, I love you so much. You've got to go straight to law school because you literally are a public defender. That is I already decided so not to go because I didn't want to take the LSAT because the logic puzzle questions were too hard. <laughs> oh my God, no, no, I will, I'll tutor you. Oh my God. So, okay, <laughs> that's so true. And I, I, first of all, I love that movie. I love that movie, except that Laura Linney is utterly wasted as the prosecutor, but whatever. But that movie yeah. made the hair on my arm stand up at the end. I remember sitting in the movie theater and when the lights went up and just being chilled to my bones. But I think it's really interesting because part of the problem for Richard Gere is that he thought he knew his client, right? He thought he had his client down and he thought he was the voice of his client in court. And 
that gave Richard Gere, the lawyer, an enormous amount of self-satisfaction and made him feel like he was good in his job, that he got his client, that he knew the story. And of course, at the end, he realizes that he's being played. And that happens a lot because you can never necessarily entirely know your client. And I mean, obviously, every attorney-client relationship is different, but there are and there aren't necessarily clients who are, who are that diabolical, but they don't have to show you their whole self. And if you believe that they have and that you really know their story better than anybody else, you're delusional. That's just not almost ever, I think, going to be the case. And I think the, the attorney-client relationships that I've had that have been the most interesting have always been the ones that have kept me a little bit off balance because... I know there's this whole other side that I'm never going to be able to see. And I think that's a really important thing to understand. And so I think if I had to watch that movie all over again, I wouldn't feel a bit sorry for Richard Gere because he should have known anyway that he could never fully know that client or any client. I mean, th this again reminds me of, of motherhood because I just read a poem basically written from the perspective of, of having a baby and being like, we're so close and yet you're a mystery to me, basically. Like, I know that you're my baby, but like, I don't, don't trick myself into thinking I understand you because obviously you're like, well, babies are unknowable because they just can't verbalize very much yet. They can't tell you what's bothering them for a start, but like, <laughs> Um, there, there is something, you know, to me that's also interesting that seems, it seems like humility is a necessary ingredient um, of parenting because you have to, like, your job as a parent is to help a person become an individual and grow up and, and leave you eventually, like, that's, that's your job. And, and, and then to understand them and and encourage them to be who they are along the way and not try to sort of mold them into the, the person that you were hoping to maybe uh, create. And there, it feels like there's, that feels like a parallel to me with the client relationship where you kind of, you get who you get basically with clients and with kids. <laughs> it's so true. Actually, this is reminding me of A River Runs Through It and at the end, after the sad events with the Brad Pitt character, I think it's the dad says, it is possible to love someone completely without complete understanding or something like that. And I always thought that summed up parenthood really well, that you what you feel in your heart is, is almost just unspeakable in terms of the amount of, of love that you feel and the ferocity of the love that you feel, but it's not a love of understanding. It's a love of, you know, biology and nurturing and watching somebody grow up. But yes, they they move away from you. And they're these three-dimensional people and you're only ever seeing, I think, one part at a time or whatever it is that they're they're letting you see. And I do think there are really interesting parallels between being a mother and being a lawyer. Not that you're necessarily in in quote unquote mom mode, but that as you say, it's important to have humility and not think I'm the one who's in control. I'm the one who's going to dictate what we do. I'm the one who's going to tell you to do this thing and then you're going to go do it because you're, I think, not giving the other person enough agency and also not allowing for the fact that there's things that they can teach and tell you, which is not to say that it's an equal relationship, certainly the parenting relationship is not. But I do think that you have to go into it giving up the idea that you're going to have perfect understanding and perfect control. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's also, that's how Richard Gere gets his comeuppance because like he he's deserving of that because he, he, he was too too sure of his own powers and uh yeah maybe i i would love to see primal fear too and see how that, <laughs> how that all shook out um i also so like i guess the fact that i learned well from this book and also from talking to you about you know just the truth that is woven into it is that 
And this comes up, I think, a few times that like if a judge sexually harasses you at trial, the, sono the stenographer won't write it down. The swears don't make it into the transcript. And like, that's something like as I cannot overstate how much growing up watching Law and Order made me feel like, yeah, the legal system is doing pretty good. You know, they're in these beautiful airy courtrooms and the judges are all like, you know, pretty lefty and they're like pushing back on McCoy, even though he <laughs> McCoy is right about everything for his whole life. And I, I, I just feel this book to me also feels like I would imagine that there's a lot of information in here that I would have no other fictional way of getting or no other way of learning except by reading an article. And like, I don't want to read articles all the time. I want to read novels. So I'm curious about just like, like when you were writing, did you, I imagine this would come up kind of organically in plot, but were you thinking like, these are some things that people just don't know about what it is like to work inside of the system. And like, I need them to at least hear about like this, this, and this. Okay, this is probably my all time favorite question. So that's another thing that sometimes people say about the book is that the judge is not believable, that he's just too much of an <laughs> odious, <laughs> that he's too much of an odious, racist, sexist pig. And public defender colleagues who I can't see, but I know are there, you know what I'm talking about when I tell you, reader, that almost everything that judge says and does, a judge has said or done to me in the course of my time being a federal public defender. And it was a very rude shock to me because at, right out of law school, I got a clerkship. Um, and actually, um, my friend Lauren, who's watching, she that's how I met her and became fast friends with her. But we worked for a judge who was just a mensch, just the most amazing human being and person and feminist and fierce, fierce feminist. And that year, all four of us were women. He was incredibly supportive of us. He was also just like an incredibly gentle person who really saw his job as trying to help people. Actually, Lauren and I went to visit him shortly before he died a couple of years ago. And the last thing he said to us when we were leaving was go find somebody and try to help them, which was his philosophy in life and certainly his philosophy with all of his clerks. And he was the reason I got my job as a federal public defender, basically because he called my boss, my, my soon to be boss so many times, she just basically hired me so that he would stop calling her. And so that was kind of my vision of, of, of a judge, someone who who really was a caring person and also just trying to get the right answer and being respectful of people. And then I got into the courtroom, into the trial, into the federal trial courtroom, and it was horrific. And I don't mean to say this about all of them, but a significant number of these judges are, are terrible people. They don't care about the law. They are abusive to the lawyers and they are particularly abusive to public defenders and they are particularly abusive to people of color and to women. And it's just, it's shocking. The names that I've been called, the harassment, and there's nothing that you can do, or there wasn't. Like in, in the early 2000s when I was practicing, you just sucked it up. That was just part of your job. You just dealt with it because there was literally nothing to do. They were appointed by the president. They were confirmed by the Senate. They had lifetime tenure. They were not going anywhere. And there was no one to complain to anyway. They were just these people sitting on a dais who could literally do whatever they wanted. And they were. and it still happens. I mean, I always have um, in my in my seminar now with my students in the racial and criminal justice clinics, I have attorneys who are public defenders come and talk and prosecutors too about race and gender bias in the courtroom. And inevitably the stories that they tell are, are pretty much just as bad. And I don't wanna say that every single judge is like this because it's not true. Most judges are not like this, but the number who are is not zero. And they are enabled by a system that's willing to put up with it and by court reporters who literally will take their hands off the stenographer pad and not type the abusive parts. So when you get the transcript back, it's devoid of the names that they called you. And I think it is important for people to understand that. I think people are more and more understanding, wow, the system is, is really unfair and the police do things like racially profile and there are wrongful arrests and wrongful convictions. But I do think we have this idea in our heads that this person in a black robe is just like incredibly fair and this the sober as a judge idea. And I just wrote a piece that's called, are judges really that awful? 
Yes, <laughs> because I think it's important to tell the other side of the story. So I, I don't think I've mentioned this to you before, Laura, but like I, someone mentioned to me that they were like, oh yeah, federal judges don't get provided with a robe. They have to buy their own and you can just buy one on the internet. Like maybe that's not true across the board, but you sure can buy them on the internet. And so <laughs> I, last month I went to a website that sells judge robes and they had like the basic model, the like not so basic model, even less basic and then the deluxe model. And so I bought the second cheapest. And I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but like there's some, <laughs> But yeah, I think I might want to do just like a photo shoot of like at the beach, drinking a beer ski in my judge's robe and like just, you know, just being a dirt bag in a judge robe. Because to me, there's something, I think that the more confident you are, the less you should feel compelled to dress up, which is obviously exemplified by how like the Silicon Valley guys wear like Patagonia vests everywhere um, and are just like, whatever, you have to listen to me. I'm disrupting apps um so i don't have to wear a nice outfit and so like if i just think that if judges were more confident in their judgely power they could come in you know just <laughs> dress like vincent vega at the end of pulp fiction and they like like you know why wear the robe 100 percent. oh my gosh we have to come up with a good reason for you to wear that robe that's not halloween where we can hang out together and i have to have another costume on so i'll i'll think about that I will definitely think about that. But my supervisor used to tell me, you know, it's really just basically a black dress. So why don't you think about it that way? It's basically an old white man in a black dress. And if you if you think about it that way, it's kind of like when Marsha was too scared to get into the car for her driver's test in the Brady Bunch. And I think it was Greg who told her or the dad, picture the guy naked. It's kind of like picture just this old man in a, in a black dress and you'll you'll maybe feel better about the dress up part of it. Yeah, and it's unfair too, because like, if you're a judge, you can wear the same thing to work every day, or you can wear whatever you want and then put something just on top of it, which, I mean, if everyone could do that, then we would be saving a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> oh no, I lost you. Um, and then there's, I feel like there's kind of smaller, sillier stuff that seems a little bit easier to, you know, just like, like the fact that the transcripts cost $90 billion, like that seems like it doesn't need to be enshrined um, in government. So like, it, I guess my question is like, if you could pick like a few structural things to change that you think would affect other things or that would just make, would make your or any other defense lawyer's life easier? Like, what would they be? Oh, I mean, there's, oh God, I don't even know where to start. That's such a big question. Um, and maybe it'll be our last one before we take listener questions. Cause I want to be, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Um, I think I would absolutely require that every single jurisdiction pay public defenders and prosecutors the same amount of money for starters so that um, they actually can make a living. Cause in a lot of places it's not equal. And that seems pretty insane. I think I would have caps on the number of cases that they have. I think I would have a system where there is a way to complain about the kind of behavior that I'm talking about that doesn't cost you your reputation or your job or your client, something terrible as a price. Um, I think also that I would, I mean, there's there's so much that sort of happens before we even get get into the courtroom, but you know, the way that that women are prosecuted and treated and what's considered a crime, a lot of times women are charged with things that don't actually turn out to be crimes like this shaken baby syndrome, which you could do a whole, you're wrong about debunking of. And just the general way that the client's humanity is really ignored and, and trod upon. And there, we used to call it, they had to sit in the penalty box behind this glass case, all shackled together, all in these jumpsuits. I mean, it's just, it's, it's meant to make people appear and feel less than human and to grind through as many cases as possible. And I feel like 
if there was a way to address that problem, it would make it so much more humane, not to mention dismantling the entire sentencing structure that we have, which, which gives people huge penalties for going to trial and um, disincentivizes exercising your right to go to trial and disincentivizes your right to testify. So God, there's just a lot, you know? Yeah, and I, I mean, my what I one of the things I love about this book is that I think it has the power to really radicalize a casual reader. Like, I feel like this is the kind of thing that, like, like my hope is that people will like pick this up at Target and be like, "I like legal thrillers," and then be like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> um, and I I want to use one of the questions actually to ask you about kind of some of this. Um, so Aaron asks, Laura, what compels you to write fiction? I'm really excited to read this book, but after writing nonfiction, what is it that writing fiction fulfills? Do you think there are things that are easier to say? Is it something you've always wanted to do? So before I get to Aaron's question, Sarah, that again is the mind meld. My dream is that it's on every spin around rack in Target, Costco, and if anybody ever flies again at the airport nearest you, because I feel like it's the kind of book that you should read on an airplane or on a rainy afternoon when your kids are driving you crazy because it reads fast or it should, but it should also just make you kind of think and ask some questions about the justice system and about how women are treated and all kinds of other questions. So that's totally my dream is that it gets pumped into every checkout item next to like the C's candies. But um, in the question, why did I always want, want to write fiction? I love making things up and with nonfiction, as, as you know, Sarah, you've got to be so scrupulous. You've got to get every word right. And sometimes the words that people are saying aren't exactly the words that you wish that they said. And sometimes the way that they're acting for purposes of your nonfiction story, you wish that maybe they would have done something a little bit different. And fiction just lets you throw all of that out the window and make up this whole world of people. And, and they can do and say whatever you want. And I love that. I love that freedom where you're not tethered to being so exact. And I think it's particularly true for attorneys and particularly true for public defenders because people are always accusing us of doing something underhanded. Prosecutors are always accusing us of, I don't know, forging witness statements or like going outside the lines. And so we're so scrupulous about like always getting everything exact in these sworn declarations and in our writing. And I brought that to my nonfiction writing for public audiences where I basically do all of my own fact checking because I'm so terrified of, of getting something wrong and having something be unveiled to be not tethered to a source or not grounded in fact. And so the stress of having to be accurate vanishes. And I like that a lot. And the other thing that I really like is it gives me room to push my ideas all the way to the brink. So I have really strong ideas about, for example, that it's important for women to be ambitious and it's important for women to go after their professional dreams and work really hard. And that it shouldn't be something that gets sacrificed at the altar of motherhood and that we shouldn't define being a good mother by being willing to just give all of that up. And yet I wanted to create a situation where I tested that belief. I stress tested it to the maximum extent possible by creating the most extreme situation I knew how to create because I really enjoy testing my own beliefs, my own fundamental beliefs. I like using fiction as a way to really push against those boundaries. And then this is, this is a process question from Rosalind that relates to um, when you were talking about, you know, this book had a previous incarnation and, you know, you, you stayed with it um, and it did, I think, some structural remodeling. And so Rosalind asked, what did you do differently to make this book work? Which I would also love to know. That's a good question. I feel like, I think sometimes the thing that especially lawyers do when we're writing is that we think things that are super interesting to us are interesting to everybody else and they're not. <laughs> that, you know, I could easily have an hour long conversation about habeas law, nobody would go to it, but I would be just as into it as I would be talking about some other thing that's interesting to most people. But when you're writing about the law, you have to be really careful to give the reader just enough information that they can follow the plot, but not so much information that they feel like they're reading a legal brief, which nobody but a lawyer would ever really want to read. And I think maybe that was the mistake I made 
the first time that I was too invested in the procedure and making everything perfectly accurate. And, and again, just going back to being able to jettison those rules, I do a couple of things in this book that are wildly impossible. And I did it because it was fiction and because I realized I didn't have to have this like perfect fidelity to reality and the reality of legal procedure, which sometimes I know it's shocking, isn't all that interesting. So I think that's, that's, the, major, that's the major change I made. And then this is a question from Valena or Valena. I'm, I hope that one of those is me saying your name right. And they write, it sounds like this is a powerful book for mothers to connect with the protagonist public defender mother and with the defendant mother. How does this book also connect with people who aren't mothers? What do you think is universally powerful about the book? So first of all, shout out to Valina, who is my intrepid writing partner, without whom nothing would happen. And for people who feel stuck in the pandemic, Valina and I have worked out a pretty awesome system, I think. We're, we're partners on Zoom. So three times a week, we see each other at a designated time and we check in about what we're doing. And then we turn off the camera and we turn off the microphone and we just write for an hour and then we come back and check in and then we go about our day. And it's been the difference for me between writing and not writing. And I think just having her there, her sweet little picture in the corner of my screen as I'm struggling is incredibly, incredibly helpful. And also just the relationship that we've gotten to form over the past year has been just really beautiful and amazing. So that's, it's a great question. Like if you're not a mom, would you be invested in this book? Cause like the protagonist is a mom and the client is a mom. And I think, I think the answer is, is yes, because it's really a book I think too, about what, what is, um, what is justice in kind of a big sense. And I don't mean, you know, guilt or innocence or did this person get a fair trial, but sort of like, what do we want a just world to really look like? And and I think that book tries to test what I imagine are most people's ingrained beliefs about that, about what justice really is and what it could look like. And I think that's something that we're all really engaged in at this moment. And so hopefully is, is universal. Oh my gosh, I think we might be at the end. 6.02, Sarah. I think, well, we're at, yeah, time o'clock. Um... Well, I, well, can I, can I be self-indulgent and ask you yes. a final question, actually? Yeah. I would just love to know, I mean, I would love to know what's next, what you want to work on, um, what you're enjoying now, and just in the vein of, you know, every, every project is like saying yes to some things and maybe later <laughs> to other things. Like, yeah, what, like, now that you have release this book into the world? Like, are there ideas that you're excited about? So I'm in the process of writing this nonfiction book that's called Ambitious Like a Mother. And it's based on an op-ed that I wrote in the New York Times in 2019, essentially about how, in my view, the work-life balance is a fraud and that it makes women who have careers and children feel stuck in this shame of guilt and self-recrimination. And for whatever reason, that essay struck a chord and then we were able to build it out into a book and it kind of operates on three different levels. So this is what I'm working on right now. So I'm just thinking about it a lot. Um, I, I start with my, with my mom's story because my mom was obviously enormously influential and a huge inspiration to me and someone who went to medical school in the 1960s when women were not going and had four children and was married and had all the stuff going on all the time and never gave up in my view being ambitious. And then sort of my story, but then also weaving in the story of all these women, I got to interview like 50 women all over the country doing all different kinds of jobs, different geographic areas, um, all different, you know, across race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, number of children, career, white collar, blue collar, pink collar. And it was, and then just doing all of the research that kind of stretches back about a hundred years of women's advancement or lack of advancement in the workplace. And it's been so interesting to get to do that and to talk to all of these women and see 
how they're struggling with the same questions because they seem like these existential questions of how do you have this a fulfilling job and have a family and not hate yourself because you feel like you're always failing. And um, the book is really meant to be an inspiration to women to tell them that they're not failing, that they're actually doing awesome and that the goal in life isn't to be excellent all the time in your marriage and your parenting and your job, that that's just not realistic. And sometimes doing an okay job in one or the other spheres is perfectly fine. And also that you can be a good mother and not, and not have to constantly sacrifice everything or hate yourself because you don't. And so that's been my big project and I'm waiting to get the edits back. And then I will hopefully um, see that to completion and then find something else to do with myself. <laughs> I don't know what, maybe I'll, maybe I'll tag along with you and Michael and be your roadie when you take your, take your wrong about on the road. I think that we should do that. And also we should do a like, why are dad's live show talking about, you know, ideally my cousin Vinny. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. But I am so signed up for that. Fear. I'm glad that you just said yeah. it publicly because now you're stuck. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. Um, yeah, I feel, I mean, we're at time and I just, I'm so excited for this book. I'm so happy that it is here and we get to put it in our beach bags and hopefully go someplace um, sunny and safe to read it. And just, I mean, is there, yeah, is there anything you want to close us out by saying? No, except I, my heart is so full and I wish I could see everybody, but I know you're there and it's incredibly meaningful to me. My Groton moms and my family and my coworkers and my federal public defender fighters and all the people that I love who I know are here. So thank you. And Sarah, from the bottom of my heart, you're like my dream interviewer. So thank you for doing this. And I think Evan, you probably wanted to just say a couple of things at the end. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you both uh, very much uh, for this. Uh, Laura, congratulations. This, this has been a really wonderful conversation. And, and, and Sarah, thank you uh, again so much for, um, for leading this conversation. Um, uh, for those of you tuned in, uh, if you don't have the book yet, um, uh, miss any uh, more of, of the event, if, if, you, if you go to, to check out right now uh, at booksmith.com, uh, the, the link is just under the video. I'll, I'll dump it in the chat again. Um, uh, also makes a great gift, both for, um, uh, for friends and, and enemies and, and little libraries everywhere. Um, uh, check it out, um, uh, uh, whether you get it from Booksmith or not. Um, although, of course, I do hope you get it from Booksmith. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I have. I hope we can meet uh, again in person, um, Laura, uh, perhaps for the next one, if not, if not before. Um, and um, yes, and uh, um, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, uh, catch some of our other upcoming events, booksmith.com. Um, see you hopefully uh, here online um, uh, in the meantime. Uh, take care, everyone. Um, be safe out there and, and, and have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>